Hello, and welcome to today's AP4D webinar on combating illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing. My name is Melissa Conley-Tyler. I'm the Executive Director of AP4D, the Asia-Pacific Development Diplomacy and Defence Dialogue, and I'm joining you today from Anawan land in the high country in New South Wales. I pay my respects to Elders past and present and uh, welcome any Indigenous people who are joining us today. Um, I'm very conscious with this topic, uh, looking at fisheries management, sustainable fisheries management, that there's a very, very strong, um, you know, millennia of uh, Indigenous knowledge on this issue. Um, and uh, I, I, I hope that there are some people who are joining us who have access to that wonderful resource. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I welcome you on behalf of our co-chairs and all the members of our advisory group. Um, we're delighted that we have so many people joining us today. We had, I think, 90 people who have registered and who will either listen today or listen afterwards as it suits them. And they absolutely represent all of those different communities, the defence, diplomacy, development communities, plus the things that don't start with D, like trade and, and, uh, and, uh, and law and law enforcement and a range of other areas. So um, I'm conscious that uh, we're still a very new organisation for, for many, and I should give you a quick introduction to who we are at AP4D. We've only been going around 18 months with our programs. Um, we'll then, I'll give you a quick outline of what's in the paper that we will be launching today. And then you're gonna be joined by three of our wonderful working group members who worked on this paper to give you their perspectives on what they think are some of the important messages. And then finally, um, we're absolutely delighted to have a special guest to have Minister for International Development and the Pacific and Minister for Defence Industry, Pat Conroy, who is going to be speaking to us, giving us a message of support to formally launch today's paper. So without any more ado, I should introduce a little bit more about AP4D and where we came from. AP4D was established with, I suppose, a simple but powerful insight that in a difficult and contested world, we need all the elements of statecraft working together. Uh, we are very much a tripartite initiative. Um, we're funded through defence and foreign affairs, and we're hosted at ACFID as the peak body for the international development sector. What we do is we bring together experts from the three Ds and more to look at key problems in Australian foreign policy and come up with options papers that give real ideas, real forward facing propositional ideas to policymakers on how we could deal with these issues. Um, we produced a, a range of publications so far. So we spent our first six months focusing on Australia and Southeast Asia, then our next six months focusing on Australia and the Pacific. We're now focusing on, on sort of more individual um, areas of, of topics. Um, one of the real successes we would see in our 18 months is that we see this idea of all tools of statecraft now is really being used as a key organising concept for Australia's international policy. So if you're interested in our most recent paper, All Tools of Statecraft, What Does It Look Like in Practice, or any of those papers we've done on the Pacific or Southeast Asia, please do visit the website and see a little bit more. Now, none of what we have done so far would be possible without the early uh, support that we got from the Australian Civil Military Centre. Uh, this enables us to bring together these experts, to produce these papers, to share these ideas and to be a platform to get good thinking to try to improve the quality of Australia's statecraft. So to tell you a little bit more about ACMC and why it supports um, AP4D, I'll hand over to Wayne Snell, Thanks, Thank Monica. you very much, Wayne. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, on behalf of our Executive uh, Director, uh, Nicola Rosenblum, I'll just give you a very quick briefing for those of you who have, haven't had any contact with the Australian Civil Military Centre before. Um, we're slightly unusual in that we're, we're, we're pretty unique, particularly inside of defence, because we, we work in concepts, con concepts and contexts, basically, where there are no easy answers. Um, the environment that we're in um, allows us to engage with a whole range of stakeholders and international counterparts, which pro again uh, allows us to extend our reach um, in order to achieve the, the, the quite unique mission that we have. And um, whilst we sit inside defence, we have a whole of government uh, remit. And our remit basically is to support um, 
the Australian uh, civil, military and police capabilities to prepare, prevent and respond to conflicts and disasters overseas. Uh, a few people then have asked me the question, why are you involved with AP4D? That is because the work of AP4D is actually part of the prepare and prevent and then leads into the response stage for those of you who've got emergency management backgrounds, how that actually works into the response stage. Uh, this one in particular, um, we're quite interested in uh, uh, because it is actually indicative um, and a really good litmus test for the uh, bilateral, multilateral and trade relationships within our area that that subsequently then lead to tension, uh, potentially competition and, you know, the, the uh, increasing uh, opportunity then for conflict within our region. Um, the other thing about AP4D was that it, it's an opportunity for us to be able to reach a much wider audience um, with a fairly modest investment, I have to say. I think Melissa probably oversells us a little bit. Uh, it's a fairly modest investment to get this off the ground. And then whilst we've invested a little bit more um, as the concept's been um, proven, um, uh, the the for want of a better word, the bang that we get for our buck um, from this particular project is probably the best that we've had in uh, ACMC's history. So um, I, I commend this work to you, and uh, personally, I look forward to to this particular work in the uh, in the fishing space within our region. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you, Wayne, and thank you for being there from the beginning, um, we, which we really, really appreciate. So what we'd like to do now is move on to formally launch our IUU fishing paper. Um, now, I will give you a bit of an idea of where it came from and the pro sort of process that we use so you can get a sense. Um, AP4D, we are not the experts. What we're about is bringing together experts. So every one of our papers is the result of an extensive consultation process. You know, we start off with research and diagnostics. We held a larger dialogue, uh, then bring that down into a smaller working group and meet multiple times, look over multiple drafts, keep giving more and more input. Um, we then try to get input from, uh, from policymakers. So we held a work in progress roundtable where we could give some of our early findings and get interesting feedback from, um, in that case, uh, DPAD, Office of the Pacific and Australian Fisheries Management Agency. And now today we are releasing the paper. And it's, I suppose, a moment where I really want to thank everyone who's been involved in this process. So we were very lucky in the initial dialogue that we had such important figures from the uh, Pacific Forum Fisheries um, Agency and from the Southeast Asia uh, Fisheries Development Centre. Um, and in terms of the working group, it has been a fabulous group, um, in particular, uh, Get going across those different areas, people who are from a defence, diplomacy, development, people who are from industry, people who are from law, people who are from Australia and people who are from the region. So uh, we really want to thank every single one of them. Um, any of you who are on the call now or who are listening later when you come back from your leave, um, know just how much we appreciated you being part of this process and sharing your insights. So uh, what you'll see in the paper, which is now online, so you can go and see it while we're talking, um, is a, very much a visioning process. What we aim for is to look, is to get people to think about what does it look like to be an effective partner in combating IUU fishing. We talk a bit about why it matters, we give different perspectives, we talk about the barriers and challenges, and in particular, we focus on what's the vision, what would we like to get to in the future, and then what are some pathways to get there? Obviously not exhausting, we're exhaustive, we're often agnostic in exactly how you get there, but we give examples. So you can see here are the sort of things that we might be doing. Now, in terms of the vision, it came through very strongly, the idea that Australia should be aiming to be a global leader in sustainable fisheries management across multiple dimensions. Understanding and recognising that it has much to offer, that it has a fantastic strong record um, in the region, um, and that it can do, do so much more, you know, deepening those partnerships and extending them out. There's also a focus on what we can do as a good global citizen at home and how we need um, to use all the different arms of statecraft. It becomes very clear very quickly just how much expertise there is in Australia, but how it is spread in so many different places. How can we bring that together for maximum effect? 
we are very clear that there's a lot happening already. And so one of the things we put in every single one of our papers is concrete examples of programs and partnerships that are already in existence, both to recognise them, but also to encourage further investment, extension of their activities. How can the things that have been working in one place be taken further? And so I don't even think this is all of them. These are all the ones I could fit on a slide of uh, the various case studies that we put into the paper. In terms of the pathways, we, we are proposing four broad pathways. One is around deepening and broadening Australia's partnerships um, in Southern Ocean, which are very strong in the Pacific, in Southeast Asia, and particularly in the Indian Ocean, where a, a lot of this uh, environment ecosystem is less developed. Um, Recognising that being a global leader starts at home, so seeing where we can adopt best practice in domestic regulations on things such as our seafood supply chain and in beneficial ownership and transparency laws. Um, thirdly, using new technology as it, as it is arriving, you know, looking at how we can be innovative in information gathering and find you know, force multipliers, new ways of doing things that help us do more with less. And then finally, building on Australia's really strong track record of capacity building and thinking about how we can extend and deepen and expand what we do in this area. So to take us through in more detail, we're absolutely delighted that we have three wonderful members of our advisory group who are joining us today. So we have Dr. Camille Goodman, who's from ANCORS at the University of Wollongong. We have Keith Twyford, who's the... Uh, Global Lead Sustainable Fisheries at the Mindaroo Foundation. And we have Dr. Michael Hazel, who's from the Griffith Asia Institute. So thank you all for joining us today. And I'm looking forward to hearing more voices than just mine on how we found this process and what we found from it. So if I can, I might start with you, Michael. Um, I think sometimes people think of IUU fishing as being a somewhat technical area, um, you know, maybe a specialist area. And I think um, you've made the point very strongly that combating IUU fishing actually is about the integrity of the international rules-based order and international legal system. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yes, certainly. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I, IUU fishing was a term that um, first was created to characterise the kinds of fishing that um, leads to depletion of stocks and overfishing. And for many, and the problem of overfishing has been go, going on for many years. Um, the thing is that the kinds of activities that lead to illegal, unregulated and unreporting, uh, unreported fishing um, have expanded um, into a number of other areas, which the paper talks about, such as uh, drug trafficking, human trafficking and other forms of um, of transnational crime. So the rules-based order essentially relies on the ability of international law and is based on international law and international uh, principles to influence the behaviour of states and re regulate these kinds of activities. Mm. So if we see large or big obstacles to um, these laws and principles being upheld and enforced, then it begins to undermine the character, the legitimacy, and in particular, the authority of these international law regimes. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the rules-based order, um, I would argue that one of the central pillars of the rules-based or order is international maritime law. Mm -hmm. And the preeminent source of international maritime law is the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, okay? So UNCLOS does a number of important things in relation to IUU fishing. Um, it sets out um, very clear rules and principles concerning um, how states should deal with marine resources, that they should do so in a responsible and sustainable way. IUU fishing obviously challenges that. Um, but and a bigger and in some ways perhaps more foundational aspect is that one of the biggest, well, I, the law of the seas sets out the principles also by which 
um, mar maritime rights are established. It doesn't make judgments about who has what maritime rights, but it talks about the principles upon which they are established. Yeah. yeah. And it also um, is important to understand that if we have these kinds of rights being in dispute because of maritime uh, uh, maritime border issues, then that again directly reflect, uh, reflects on the authority of the convention. Now, in the past, one of the major contributors to IUU fishing has been the number of maritime disputes, the, the long and ongoing maritime disputes in the South China Sea that has prevented cooperation that has prevented uh, uh, better reporting, better regulation because of the lack of cooperation between states. But now what we're seeing is China's very large and um, unreasonable uh, claim in the South China Sea, which directly challenges UNCLOS, particularly since its rebuttal of the 2016 uh, arbitration panel ruling mm. um, in, in the Philippines case against China. So China continuing with this claim and using um, its considerable state capacity to enforce this claim through the use of grey zone tactics, for example, is a direct challenge to the authority and the legitimacy of UNCLOS itself, and therefore also the international maritime order. Thank you. Well, can I go to you, Keith? Um, we're talking about what a challenge it is. I, I'm interested in what are the drivers? You know, what, are you, what is driving what we're seeing in terms of both illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing? Because I think there are different drivers for each, yes? Yeah, I'd agree with that. Melissa, there's, there's a lot of different drivers and it's a very uh, contextual and situation dependent sort of an, an arrangement. So the drivers of say what's happening in the Western Indian Ocean industrial tuna fishery, for example, uh, are different to what's happening in the, in the Pacific tuna fishery, although there's some overlaps, but certainly vastly different to what's happening with um, small scale fisheries and artisanal fisheries in coastal waters. So if we don't properly understand that context and the drivers, then we'll We'll often use the wrong solutions for the, the problems at hand. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, having said that, there are some common drivers, I guess, that we, that we can recognise, and poverty is one of those, and the paper picks up this, that, um, you know, that, that IUU fishing is often undertaken because it's, uh, it's, a, it's a, a food security issue or it, it's uh, an income or a livelihood issue, so it's, a, you know, it's a very much a development issue. Um, Another driver is just greed and, and maximising profit. Like we're, we're not talking about small fisheries here that are, are not worth much. We're talking about highly lucrative fisheries that are big money. Like in the Pacific, there was an attempt to quantify the amount of IUU fishing that was under, undertaken, what it was worth, and it's about between 500 and 750 million US a year. So it's it's big money. So um, and there's a lot associated with. It's not always a legal activity. It can be unreporting, uh, can be misreporting or underreporting. So it's not always illegal. Um, another driver, and Michael touched on this as well, is just transnational crime. And, and often illegal fishing, IUU fishing is hiding other crime. And that might be uh, modern slavery, such as forced labour or um, people trafficking or, or, or drugs. These things often go hand in hand, in hand or hand in glove, unfortunately. Um, I think another driver is, is the ability of uh, fishers to act with impunity and basically they, they can get away with it and and you know you've got to ask the question well, why is that what's the driver for that and there's many factors to it but part, often it's lack of government capacity so they don't, either don't have the laws or not able to implement them effectively um, it can be just government indifference they don't particularly care or it can be you know, direct corruption is another driver um, it can be just poorly coordinated enforcement between all the different agencies that are involved in, in fisheries and can be all can be all of those It can be organized crime syndicates um, which are which are prevalent in some fisheries and sometimes they're state, state sponsored Michael touched on China sometimes they're not um, so a lot of, there's a lot of different drivers there and it would be 
remiss of me not to touch on climate change as one at, at, at the end. And I think that's it's a, a really important driver, but I think it's also important that we don't conflate it and, and um, focus on it as the only driver because that's just a get out for actors to not do anything or to say it's all too hard. So climate change is definitely a driver, but uh, it's not the only one. And sometimes it's not actually the most important one either. Mm-hmm. Well, and listening to all of those drivers, it feels big and difficult. So, Camille, um, the paper says that Australia can be a global leader in this. Um, do you think that's realistic? Thanks, Melissa. I, I absolutely do think it's realistic. Um, I mean, we all know you can lead in lots of ways. You can lead by example. You can lead by driving something. You can lead by supporting something. And I think the paper shows how Australia is equipped in all sorts of different ways to fulfil all these sorts of different leadership roles. Um, It's well equipped to lead on fisheries in a geographic sense uh, because of where we are on the, you might say, the fulcrum of the Indian and Pacific Oceans and we're a coastal state in both oceans and in the Southern Ocean Uh, and we're also a fishing state with fishing interests in all of those areas. Um, Australia's well equipped in a technical sense, it's got its own well-developed fisheries management and enforcement systems and a lot of expertise to share. Um, it's well positioned strategically, I think, in terms of Australia's own national interests in fisheries. We have uh, a strong fishing industry, but we're not captured by that fishing industry. And we have the ability to uh, reflect multiple issues when we're managing fisheries. Uh, and we have domestic and regional interests in influencing and engaging with fisheries interests. So in a domestic sense, we have really good fisheries management. And I would say that's recognised internationally. Uh, If anyone's interested in knowing more about the status of Australian fisheries and actually looking at the evidence, not how it might be reported in different places, um, I would just recommend going and having a look at the fishery status reports, which are produced every year by the Australian Bureau of Agricultural and Resource Economics. They're great. They're freely available on the ABARES website and they evaluate the biological and economic status of Australian fish stocks. So you can really see how Australian fisheries are being managed. Um, But then it's not, obviously, leadership isn't just domestic and and Australia's got a strong history as a regional and global leader, I would say, in fisheries. We're party to all the relevant international agreements and Australia, I would describe it as a committed and constructive member of regional fisheries management organisations to at least two in the Pacific, I won't name them all, they've got long names, but in the Pacific, in the Indian Ocean, in the Southern Ocean, um, we're there and we're engaged and working with other members on how to manage shared fish stocks beyond our borders. Um, And we then provide our technical expertise to other countries in those areas through participation in other organisations, in particular, I'm sure we'll talk about them, the Forum Fisheries Agency in the Pacific and what we call the G16 group of coastal states, which is largely developing coastal states in the Indian Ocean as they sort of try to cooperate in um, developing their own fisheries. And then I guess finally I'd say in terms of leadership that Australia has had a strong record in um, you might say progressive forward leading approaches to the compliance and enforcement mechanisms that are necessary to sort of give effect to good fisheries management. Um, and you've already mentioned, people have already mentioned Southern, Southern Ocean fisheries. Um, the, Australia's conducted some long and difficult at sea enforcement operations, which have really um, implemented the law and shown what the law looks like in practice and been tested. Uh, And then they've been involved in Port State Measures Agreement, the new A Treaty Subsidiary Agreement, innovative new agreements to try and find ways to enforce fisheries. So I think across the board, um, a strong basis for continuing to lead. And and so much to draw on. Yeah, so um, what I might do is, I suppose, break that down a little, because one of the reasons we chose this as a topic for AP4D is it seems to us that there are so many different arms of statecraft that are working in this area, you know, some in the defence, diplomacy, development, law, law enforcement. So I was going to go go back to you, Michael, just to, you know, give some examples of how the different tools of statecraft, you know, really do contribute to combating IUU fishing. Yes, thanks, Melissa. Um, Look, I mean, IUU fishing has always been a very difficult and complex problem. And... um, it's only become more so over recent years. Um, So it clearly requires a whole of government approach, which is one of the points that 
the paper makes. And not only from Australian governments, but all governments that are engaging with this issue and trying to manage it. So, I mean, defence, of course, has a role. Um, defence has a very important role in securing um, uh, maritime boundaries. Um, it provides important surveillance uh, operations, important data, um, enforcement when required, as Australia, the Australian experience demonstrates. Um, diplomacy is extremely important in terms of, of, of creating um, the conversations with other governments in order to find avenues of, of, uh, of cooperation and common ground. Um, law, as I've already mentioned, is extremely important in this in terms of basically providing the framework for states to follow in their management of these issues. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's really very much a whole of government approach. The South China Sea, touching on maritime law enforcement, um, since about 2014, when China took on um, a much more aggressive approach, approach to its claims in the South China Sea, um, it's been very careful to do it in a way that avoids crossing any um, red lines in terms of responses from other states. And that's essentially the essence of the gray, the gray zone tactics that it's using. So um, in order to do that, it's been requiring on, it, it's been relying on civilian assets, the Coast Guard, and in particular, the fishing militia, which it uses to flood um, the exclusive economic zones of other states and essentially just occupy them as a way of asserting its, its claims and its rights. Um, we need to be careful not to fall into the trap that grey zone tactics create. And that is, if one uses a military response, then the onus and the responsibility for, for escalation falls on you rather than China, despite the fact that they've been provoking it. So I think that it's really important for, in terms of dealing with um, the kinds of issues that exist in the South China Sea at the moment, it's really important to perhaps give more emphasis to better and more capable maritime law enforcement as a response to what is happening there, because that as I said, keeps it on the civilian level and to some degree at least reduces the risk of military escalation, which is the last thing anybody wants. Understood. Well, I might go back to you, Camille. Um, I think the, the answer to any of those questions that you know we're talking about has to be about regional partnerships. So I'm interested in you know, what opportunities you see in deepening Australia's um, regional partnerships. It's a bit like the drivers in that I think there's there's different opportunities in different places. Um, so I suppose the first category we might think about is the Pacific Island Forum countries, the FFA members, and, you know, in that context, Australia is already deeply engaged and a long-time close partner of many of those countries. Um, so I suppose in that context, for me, I think the opportunities to deepen and broaden partnerships really lie in being clear-eyed about the strength and strategy of the Pacific Island countries themselves, who have already proven their ability to innovate, cooperate, implement, leverage good outcomes on fisheries issues, given the support and opportunity, um, and following, following their lead. So maybe that's a leadership through support sort of example. Um, and uh, in the next few years, I think a really big area there for deepening and broadening engagement on fisheries is likely to be supporting the steps necessary to ensure we deal equitably with the challenges that are coming as a result of climate change and its impact on fisheries in the Pacific. Um, but then if you look at a second category, perhaps of opportunity, you might think of the Indian Ocean, um, where the coastal states are not as closely engaged as in the Pacific. They do not have such closely aligned interests. They don't have such a close history of cooperation. So the opportunities there are a bit different in how we deepen and broaden relationships. And I think it's around supporting those G16 coastal states to uh, refine, identify and implement their agenda uh, and draw perhaps on what we've learned in the Pacific context and see what can be transferred to the Indian Ocean and what might need to develop organically in that different context to suit a different circumstance. 
Mm. And um, I suppose thirdly, I would just point to um, sort of addressing what Michael was talking about, the opportunity to coordinate and cooperate with other fishing nations and other coastal states in the Indo-Pacific who share our goals around sustainable fisheries management, as well as some of those broader goals relating to what um, I might call a rules-based maritime order and the success yeah. of the Law of the Sea project. Um, and you might think readily of Korea, Japan, Indonesia, the US, some of those other South China Sea countries, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei. So um, for some of those, we have been engaged in fisheries in the past, but perhaps not always on exactly the same page. Um, but I think increasingly that strengthening and deepening engagement with them is going to be important to successful outcomes, both in the, the rules-based maritime order context of a consistent understanding of the framework, but also in terms of within the regional fisheries management organisations where we participate in fisheries management. Perhaps we each have relationships with different groups and we can each broker um, sort of common approaches Again, particularly as we seek to deal with new new challenges, and I and I mentioned climate change again. Mm, absolutely. Well, Michael, I'll just get you to build on that, uh, particularly around the like-minded partners. You know, where do you see the potential there? Um, well, I think um, in the Pacific there are, are many. Um, in fact, all of the states I think are very very interested in this and interested in doing more. Southeast Asia provides a somewhat more complicated picture. Um, uh, again, China's in, uh, grow, growing influence there has a lot to do with this. Um, and also, I mean, the, the problems with trying to regulate fisheries in the South China Sea aren't um, as widely shared amongst the ASEAN countries as one would like in order for ASEAN to work in a very unified way towards this. So the literal states um, are the ones that are on the front line, the states like Malaysia, like the Philippines, like Vietnam. They're the ones that have most at risk in terms of their rights and entitlements. Um, and But those concerns are not shared by everyone in ASEAN, unfortunately. So. Um, I think it's really important for us to make a beginning by um, focusing our attentions on the states that have the most to lose and therefore are the most motivated to improve how this issue is being managed. Okay, yeah. IUU fishing, um, you know, it's it's become uh, a big part of the story of China's attempted takeover of the South China Sea. But it, I mean, it's not just about China, leaving China aside, it's about, um, you know, uh, the prospect of a total collapse of the region's fisheries. And if that happens, it's going to have a terribly destabilizing effect. I mean, the people that are now fishing in the South China Sea will have to go elsewhere, which means they'll be going into other people's territory, other people's exclusive economic zones, in particular Australia's. So it's going to cause a whole lot of trouble for Australia in terms of its own maritime border security as well. And it makes the national interest very clear. Yeah. And it makes the national interest. And of course, if we see that kind of collapse, then um, you know the, the problems that I mentioned earlier with the authority of the international maritime regime are just going to um, become much greater. Thank you. Well, I'll just remind all our audience members, don't let me monopolise this. We want your questions. We want to hear the questions you'd like to ask our working group members. So can I go to you, Keith? Um, I'm conscious um, that, uh, you know, sustainable fisheries management is more than just IUU. So could you tell us a bit more about what you think Australia has to offer on sustainable fisheries management more generally? Yeah, I think there's a couple of uh, elements to this, Melissa. Uh, part of it's government, part of it's other other actors, I suppose. But but government, I think, you know, beyond IUU and and um, enforcement and compliance, um, I think Australia can offer a lot in its experiences and expertise in fisheries and marine biodiversity sciences more broadly and, and oceanic sciences. Um, I think our fisheries management approaches, and by that I mean laws and regulations. Um, licensing quota systems those type of things are, are robust they're, they're not perfect but they're robust and uh, offer 
opportunities for others to, to use them as appropriate. Um, I think our experiences in use of marine reserves and marine protected areas and fishery closure areas for fisheries purposes uh, it, it is, again, is something that can be applied more broadly. It's a controversial topic, but it's one that I think that we, we have a lot of experience in from the Great Barrier Reef and other, other places over decades. And uh, I think we, it's a real opportunity there for us to share that and, and lead the discussion. I think also that at times we overlook the, how effective we are in this collaboration between state and national governments. And again, far from perfect, but we do it a lot better than uh, many other places who do it appallingly. Um, and technological solutions is probably another one that I'm far from being an expert, but I think a wealthy country like Australia uh, can play a real role in, in in R&D and investing up front, taking some of the investment risks and then allowing uh, failures to happen and successes to emerge and, and for that to then be applied elsewhere, so where, where it's appropriate. Um, another element of sustainable fisheries that, that Camille's touched on um, very eloquently is this one about how Australia supports regional organisations. I won't repeat that, but just to say I wholeheartedly agree that how, how well managed the, the Pacific is and the opportunity that, that may exist to do that in the Indian Ocean would be just amazing if that could happen. Um, and lastly, I'll, I'll just touch on philanthropics because that's where I come from. And so it's non-government, so, but the, there's a role there for funders like Mindaroo and, and others to play a role because we don't just bring cash and often a, a lot of it, but we, are, we can do and say things that governments can't. And we have different networks in the business and in the governments that um, Australian government and others don't have. So uh, I think that's another role that Australia can play is using government and non-government organisations and philanthropics. Oh, thank you, Kate. Um, well, my next question is to Camille, and I think we can bring in Mark Nicholson's excellent question on this. So I was interested in hearing more about what capacity building looks like. You know, it's a key part of what the paper says um, and would love to hear some more examples. And uh, Mark has noticed in particular, you know, issues around under-resourced, underfunded national fisheries agencies, lack of enforcement skills and knowledge of compliance officers. And so I suppose that question is, you know, what role has Australia got in capacity building? Thanks, Melissa, and thanks, um, Mark. Great questions. And, and I would start by saying I think um, the paper does a really good job of setting out some really concrete examples of capacity building, so it's a great place to look. Um, so maybe I'll just focus on two examples that sort of go to Mark's question in particular. Um, I would say, first, we can support training and professional development for officials in these countries to make sure they are as well equipped as possible to develop and implement and advocate for the priorities, the strategies that best suit the needs of their countries, not one size fits all, but to allow them to implement their own solutions. And then, and I'll build on each of these, but then I think we can support them in securing and implementing these priorities through regional and international organisations. So in terms of training, I guess um, I take the approach and, and coming from ANCORS, we deliver a lot of this training. So I suppose I declare my conflict of interest, but um, I think the people who are best placed to identify the needs and priorities for combating IU fishing are the relevant officials of regional countries themselves. And we've already talked about how the drivers are so different and the situations are different, um, but we can, we can give them tools to help them do that. Um, so ANCORS runs a number of international fisheries negotiation courses, for example, um, and we're currently in funding discussions with international agencies to support more courses for Pacific and Indian Ocean programs. And often that involves um, coming to Wollongong and spending time here doing courses here or us going there for training. Uh, and we've also got a new MOU with the Solomon Islands National University. We're planning to co-develop a new graduate certificate in Pacific fisheries management. Um, so I think funding opportunities and uh, discussions with government about those things will be another um, consideration for where capacity building might be funded. And the other example that might be interesting, we recently ran a Women in Maritime Security course with DFAT, um, which involved Navy, Coast Guard and foreign affairs officials from a number of Southeast Asian countries. And that combined training on law of the sea and maritime security with leadership and management training. And also it focused, and I think this is important, focused on building a network 
of women in maritime security that would um, continue and expand. So I think that there's a real opportunity to consider how we could do that in the fisheries space um, for women and with GEDC um, implications, but also more broadly. Mm. Um, and then when we have done this training, we can then support the ideas and suggestions that come out of it when countries raise them in regional fisheries forums. And I think we can support their positions in ways that will allow other countries and particularly developing countries, small island developing countries, to fully exercise and realise their own rights as coastal states in the region, particularly with respect to decisions about allocation and make sure we don't allow disadvantages of history, if you like, to become sort of unassailable rights of developed states as we go forward. Understood. And, and Keith, would you like to come in on that on the capacity building side? Yeah, just a quick one to add to what Camille's saying. I think the other thing to say about capacity development is that it should occur at multiple levels. And sometimes um, it's the problems are actually at um, organisational and, and or system Level, so it's not so much at an individual officer level or individual person. So it might, it might be, and Mark asked the question about how, how do you address how do you address impunity. Often it'll be at um, at legal levels or the organisation and collaboration between different organisations is just not there. So um, the capacity building needs to be at a different level and dealing with say policy reforms or regulatory reforms or helping um, government agencies work together and this is sort of something that we're doing in most of the countries we work in as well like looking at regulatory reform and national policy and national maritime um, marine spatial planning that type of thing that that's mm. capacity development as is training mm. well maybe i can stick with that at while i am reminding everyone please please do keep putting questions into the question and answer um you know when you talk about regulatory reform sometimes that all sounds like we're you know we're asking others to do it but there are also issues for us are there not in being a global leader and um and showing that you know how can we set an example in some of the areas in our own regulatory reform yeah well i, I guess um a lot of this comes back to our seafood import laws in, in australia and um they're, 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 and they're not that good in our, in our country and they're really in need of, of substantial reform so that we create a more a level playing field between Australian um, fishers and and their product and what's coming in from, from overseas. So as a minimum, we should have regulations that uh, make it clear that we know where the product's coming from, you know, what country. Uh, we should know that it's caught legally, um, that it's correctly labelled, that we're eating snapper and not stingray, that we're, we're eating farmed prawns or wild prawns, that type of thing. Um, so I think that's an important um, reform that's needed. And you know we're, we're leading an alliance called um, Fair Catch Alliance that's aiming to encourage the government to do, to do just that. And I think the other thing that we should be doing um, as an example is, is um, encouraging buying far more Australian product. It, and uh, caught whether it's wild caught or farmed seafood, and that's far more preferable to importing product from overseas that might be of doubtful provenance, uh, might have been illegally caught, or it might have used uh, modern slavery or forced labour to, to produce it. So I think there's two bits to this. One is um, buy more Australian seafood, whether it's farmed or, or wild caught, but also reform to our uh, import laws. I see that. And we have a, an excellent question from Karen von Strogkoch from University of New England, um, who talks about uh, those same issues that, you know, Australia imports about 70% of its seafood, even though we have such a large exclusive economic um, zone. Um, and, you know, those questions around what sort of dietary guidelines do we have, you know, what sort of uh, seafood consumption should we be encouraging and you're saying for example it should be a lot on Australian product and we should have a very good seafood supply chain. Yeah, yeah definitely and I think we should, we should be supporting um, Australian small businesses as well so fishing um, fishing fleets and uh, and the, the supply chains that are, that are associated with that. Um, seafood's recognised as a very very important um, source of protein and particularly, it doesn't really matter where, but developing countries, many of them, even if their coastal states don't eat enough seafood, and Timor-Leste, classic example of that, lots of, lots of fishing activity happens there, um, but uh, it's a pretty undeveloped uh, fishery sector and people don't eat enough fish, and that has enormous contributions to um, 
particularly ch early childhood development and uh, and brain development. So, yeah, we should eat more fish, and we definitely should eat more Australian fish. Understood. And if I can, I'll, I'll take that opportunity to mention that at this time, in one week's time, AP4D is launching a paper on how Australia can build a shared future with Timor-Leste. And I will give you a sneak peek. One of the things we do talk about is fisheries and agriculture. So thank you, Kate. Now, this is your last chance, everyone online. Um, last chance to put in a question and answer and get some sort of response. Um, so I'd just like to Bella go to Bella Anis, who's been very patient um, and who's asked us around biodiversity and import expert uh, or export on agriculture and commodities. Um, so coming very much from a you know, small island developing state um, perspective, um, would be interested in your take on some of those issues around biodiversity and import exports. So who would like to, to go on that? Keith, do you want to come in? Anyone else? Sorry, Melissa, I missed that. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. So it's a question from Bella Anis, who's asking about um, issues around biodiversity and import expert or support on agriculture and commodity. And um, her perspective is she's coming from a small island developing state and looking around, you know, agriculture and commodity industry. Mm. Um, seafood, from a seafood import point of view, the, the majority of seafood that we import comes from Vietnam, um, China and uh, Thailand and, and a few other states in Southeast Asia. Um, again, the majority of it, that's, we, we do import something like 60 to 70 percent of all the seafood that we eat. The majority of that, though, is farmed, so from aquaculture sources and a lot of it's canned, a lot of it's canned tuna. So we don't import a huge amount of um, wild caught seafood, but we, we do import some. There's no, there's no doubt about that, and and that's the area that we're certainly concerned about is making sure this level playing field exists between um, countries that we import from and the domestic sector, so that uh, everybody's treated the treated the same. That we don't have unreasonable expectations on the domestic sector. There was another question that was related to this. I think it comes back to cost, and that oftentimes you can. Um, purchase imported products, say um, Barca fillets, for example, much cheaper than you can Australian product. And I think a lot of Australian fishermen would argue that that's because of the amount of regulation and compliance that they have to, under, they have to go through compared to um, what's in, in developing countries where there's often no or very poor regulation in place. Oh, thank you. Well, I think I will get enough time just to ask each of you one last question. So I will manage to make a double barreled if I can. So I just want to ask each of you, I suppose, as an individual, you know, what, what did you find interesting about being involved in a process like this, working across these different areas? And, you know, what message would you like a reader to take out of this paper? So I might start with you, Camille. Oh, thanks, Melissa. This was a really, um, it was a fun exercise to be involved in. It was great to see where we all started off coming from many different perspectives and discussing many different drivers of IU fishing. And ultimately, I think we were able to sort of narrow that down to some some areas of commonality and some and some common recommendations. And it was great as an academic to be involved in a process that wasn't about academic theory or contributing to the literature. It was about how can we solve a real problem that exists um, in a policy paper that will go to government and policymakers. So that was a great opportunity. Um, in terms of what I want somebody to take out of it, um, as, as anyone in the group knows, um, lawyers have a real problem these days with the term IUU fishing. It's a glitzy term that we sort of use to encompass all sorts of things. And, and for lawyers, it means what it says in the definition, but it's come to mean a lot of other things. Um, things, all sorts of bad behaviour committed in different ways for different reasons. But I think ultimately, and we've sort of covered this really, the things that enable or incentivize IUU fishing are so much broader and they go right back to good fishing fisheries management practices and right back to a shared understanding of the legal framework of the importance of UNCLOS, of maritime zones and of rights and obligations um, and the effective operation of that system. So that, that, that would be my takeaway. Mm. Well, and can I say, I can promise you that this has gone to government and policymakers. So we've been delighted to share the results so far with DFAP, 
with Australian Border Force, with Australian Fisheries Management um, Agency and with Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry um, officials. Um, so the message is getting out there and it is being heard, which is fantastic. So, Michael, what about you? I mean, what did you find interesting and what would you like people to take away from this? Um, well, I found it all extremely interesting. Um, the first thing I'd say is um, I found it extremely edifying um, to, talking to all the, the different people who contributed to this paper, uh, people like Keith, people like Camille, many others. Um, I just learned so much about the, the broader dimensions of, of the problem of IUU fishing. Um, uh, I think in terms of what I want people to take away from it, um, particularly at the policy level, is um, that IUU fishing is a problem that's been around for a long time, but it's now a very different beast to what it was 10, 20, 30 years ago. Essentially, it's become a much bigger and a much more complex problem. It's very much a wicked problem in lots of ways. Um, and um, it can be framed in many, many ways. It's multifaceted. It's a wildlife management problem. It's an environmental problem. It's a food security problem. It's a problem for economies relying on fisheries. It's a humanitarian and ethical issue. Um, it's a problem of sovereignty and international law. I mean, there are just so many framings of this problem. Um, so I think that it's important for our government and other governments to understand that it is directly in our national interest to do something to manage the problem of IUU fishing um, better than we have, essentially. It's directly in our national interest to do so. And in just a few seconds, we're going to see how the government responds when I go to Minister Conroy. So, Keith, your last thoughts. Uh, for me, Melissa, this, the, this has been a sort of an, an almost atypical approach to government policy development. And I, often you, you, you come in at the tail end and it's 90% done, you get to comment. Um, this has turned it up the other way. So I really, like, I really like that. And it also has just flushed out this multi-headed hydra that is IUU fishing and sustainable fisheries. It's, it's, uh, it's very complicated and it needs a very nuanced approach, not one size will fit all. The, the, the key message for me is that I think there's some real opportunities here for the Australian government to do more in a better way. And what about if DFAT or the Australian government designed and, and invested in a major fisheries and marine conservation program in, in each of the three regions of interest to us? So the Indian Ocean, Southeast Asia and the Western Central Pacific um, and across the three bits of statecraft, the, the three Ds. Uh, d development, d uh, diplomacy and defence. Um, you know, New Zealand MFAT have been doing this for a while and I think they're better at it than us. They've got a much more cohesive and co coherent program. Um, that hurts a bit and, you know, we could, do, we could do better, I think. So I think that's a real opportunity to, to, to pick up, um, design some programs for those three regions in, that cover the three, the three elements that, that um, AP4D are covering. Fantastic. Well, look, thank you so much to all of you and to all the working group members who've been involved in this. Um, and I hope some of them are on the line and listening to this today. I'm sorry I won't be able to go to any more questions because I'm now turning to our policymakers' response. So um, we're absolutely delighted that Minister for International Development in the Pacific and Minister for Defence Industry, Pat Conroy, has taken the time to read and respond to this paper. So I'll go now to his message that he would like us all to hear. Hi, I'm Pat Conroy, Australia's Minister for International Development in the Pacific. Thank you to AP4D for convening this symposium. Congratulations on the launch of your paper on illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing today. This is such a critical issue for our region and this paper makes a valuable contribution. Many of my ministerial counterparts from across the region frequently refer to the Pacific as the Blue Continent. It's no surprise then that well-managed and sustainable fisheries are an essential part of sustainable economic aspirations for communities and countries across the region. 
The Pacific region has demonstrated the benefits of working together and can now boast that it is home to the world's only regional tuna fishery where all four key commercial tuna stocks are sustainably managed. But we continue to face major challenges and threats. Illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing undermines our region's economic development. For Pacific Island countries, the estimated economic loss in offshore fisheries is around 43 million US dollars annually. 5% of this is from unlicensed illegal fishing and the rest from licensed vessels that break the rules and don't report their catch. A difficult problem that requires innovative solutions. Australia is proud to work with our Pacific partners. We've done so for decades now and we are stepping up our support as we face new and emerging challenges. Australia is a founding member of regional organisations like the Pacific Community and the Forum Fisheries Agency that improve the management and our understanding of fisheries. We continue to support these organisations. We support Pacific Island countries to strengthen legislative frameworks and information sharing to increase the chance of successful prosecution. We are supporting emerging technologies such as onboard electronic monitoring. Patrol boats and aerial surveillance provided under our maritime security program strengthen the ability of Pacific Island countries to monitor and control fishing in their maritime zones. This new paper illustrates ways in which Australia can continue to be a global leader in sustainable fisheries management. To all of you attending today's launch, thank you for the critical work you do to promote sustainable fisheries management and maximise the benefits to people in our region. I want to finish by acknowledging the contribution of AP4D to a range of critical topics that span Australia's interests in the region. This paper is another valuable addition. Thank you. Well, all that is left for me is to echo the Minister's thoughts and thank everyone who's been involved in this process, to thank all of our speakers today, to thank all of the working group members who are part of it, our advisory group members who guide AP4D's work, to thank all of you who joined us today um, for, your, for your interest and for your questions. So I just remind you, as I say, that it's a busy time at the moment for AP4D. We're launching another two papers in the next week. So you are very welcome to come and hear what's come out of those processes. Um, it's very much worth getting on, getting involved with what we're doing, um, getting on our mailing list, following us on social media so you can hear what we're doing. And when you find it interesting, please do get involved. Um, so I'd just like to finish by thanking um, ACMC for supporting this project, um, all of our, our colleagues at ACFID who host us and make it possible for us to do our work, and of course for the wonderful AP4D team that makes all of this possible and makes it look much smoother and easier than it actually is. So thank you all. It's been a wonderful discussion, and I hope to see you all again soon.